I have a question for you. What would you give to know that every single time you turn on your trading screens, no matter what is going on in the markets, you have an edge that 99% of other traders don't have? The information that you need to trade with that level of confidence is actually available to you right now via every single trading platform under the sun for free. It's just that no one has ever taught you how to find it or how to read it. I'm talking about tape reading, which is the subject of the interview that you're about to watch. I'm Charlie Bathgate, I'm the CEO of Sangalucci.com and WallStreetJesus.com, and we are the creators of the Sangalucci Master Course, which is the place where traders go to learn tape reading and options trading. If you are a serious trader and you are committed and ready to take your trade to the next level, you owe it to yourself to consider tape reading. Go to the description of this video and set up a call with a member of our team to learn more about the Sangalucci Master Course. The next live session starts in just a couple weeks, and this is the last time that we are giving away lifetime access to the course when you sign up. So now is the time to do it. Okay, enjoy the interview. All right, what's up, everybody? Hey, everybody. We are live. Give live. us a second. God, we are never live. Oh, it's live. the first time live, everybody, for us. <laughs> no, we did them live before on Zoom, but just not, you know, not YouTube live. Not YouTube at all. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we're going to get started in a second, everyone. So if you need to grab your substance of choice or whatever choice it is that you are indulging in while you watch us blabber on, go do it. And then we Rant are going to get started. Um, and yeah, Matt is going to be in the chat. So if you guys have questions or anything like that, definitely drop them into the chat. What's up, everybody? Andrew, Sean. Yep. I see you guys. Uh, Drop any questions, comments. <clears throat> Everybody always has a lot of questions for Chris because he speaks in riddles. So you know, we'll uh, we'll get them answered for you as, as yeah, much as we, we can. Right? You can't we can't answer anything. Why? Oh, Charlie, we were talking about the Wall Street Journal poll that came out today. Yep. About the only thing that matters is money. <laughs> People, well, people are increasingly caring about money and less right. about like community and religion and. You know, I can't remember what else was in there. So, right, having children was going down. Yep. Right, and then and then we wonder why mental health is under assault when people but, are just like fuck everything else. But 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 is it a is it a, a thing of like you know hey you got to learn to trade it's just a skill because if everybody everybody it, it was like they did a giant poll years ago in new york city about women's number one complaint about men and and that poll suggested that men were too passive and i was like wait a minute men aren't stupid right then they're not passive when it comes to dating but it, what the the poll failed to point out was that the ratio of women to men in new york was so strong that it appeared from the woman's side that men were too passive it was just a numbers game however that was not represented and i'm saying here that the poll saying that money is valuable maybe people are actually starting to recognize that the corporate world is not going to be their savior or the government's not going to be their savior and they need they're becoming more self-sufficient in regards to taking charge of their money yeah right so in a sense Name right you're ob Right, you're obligated, you're obligated to do the best you can for your money. Right. And I mean, whether you like it or not. So in a, in a sense, I'm saying that this is a skill that seems to be um, garnering more uh, respect or at least importance on a larger, broader scale. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can say I mean, that. Um, I, mean, I mean, it's a positive spin on, on, on greed is good. Right. <laughs> Right. The Wall Street speech. Well, on that note, let's officially kick it off. Let's get started. Okay. So this is the fourth episode in our Everything is Tape series. I'm uh, Charlie Bathgate. If you don't know me, I'm the CEO of Sanglucci.com and WallStreetJesus.com. And I'm joined today by the fourth guest, the anchor, the caboose of this entire interview series, Chris Katie. Chris, say what's up? Hey, you guys, thanks for coming. Um, it's been a while. Um, today, for everybody watching, is um, March 27th. Um, the S&P closed right around 4,000. And uh, so for people watching at a later date, if you have any, if you need to know where our reference is and the date is, just so you know, um, that's what we're talking about. Hey, Charlie, yeah. this tape this tape is everything idea. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's a Lucci thing, right? I was thinking that Lucci, Lucci didn't have any teachers. Lucci's self-taught, right? 
Uh, he had teachers, but he, I mean, he, ah, that's a good question. I mean, in the prop firm that he, where he started out, he definitely right. was learning tape from some of these guys, but they weren't giving him like a lot of hands-on tutelage. I mean, he was like going over, the way that he learned was actually going over the records of their tape. He would go through their trades and then he would right. go through the tape and at, at the end of aftermarket close for like four hours every day. And It's like a, a, a forcenic um, accounting sort of, or, you know, looking back. Yeah. Yeah, saying, exactly. Well, that's why I took him. That's why I took him. I, I mean, one of the reasons we first put together the the master course is because he was like, "There's got to be a faster way for people to learn tape." Because it took him a year to learn that way. It's a yeah. very slow way to learn tape. Yeah, uh, thorough but slow. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, you, right. you know, I asked him his criteria on re in regards to choosing a teacher in in one of our misfits, and he was saying that you know, first he said, you know, he goes, he's funny. He goes, kid can't be young. And <laughs> But he didn't really have any criteria, and I was thinking about the reason that he's so he's so on the tape all the time was that he, you know, on the floor we had all sorts of different, you know, it was like a Noah's Ark, two of everything. Mm -hmm. And so we had access to many more teachers and also people who were, it was one of those things that like that guy made $70 million, you know, and he's teaching a class and you could go and you could choose you know, you could choose from a myriad of different strategies that right. were avail available to learn. Right. And that, and so w w when the floors went away, of course, every, that opportunity to, to capture that knowledge has gone. I mean, we're, what we're doing now is we're trying to take the best of those ways and pass it on through this course. But that's what um, you're here for, man. Come on. That's what, what, you, what, you, basically, what, what right, are we having this conversation? I'm the, right. I'm the elder Eskimo, and that's teaching the younger Eskimos, right? Uh, I mean, like, seriously, I want, that's one of the places I want to start with this is you're, when we were talking about how you use tape. I mean, we were doing some prep for this, and you were talking about the tape in the context of the, of the floor. Yeah, the think rain, about it, right? right? Like, okay, you know, I'm going to go to Wall Street. Okay, how do you go to Wall Street? Well, where do the black sheep go? They go to the commodities exchange because you're not going to get in on the floor of the big board. That's landed gentry, right? You needed to know somebody or work your way up as a clerk for a hundred years before you ever got a chance to stand out in front of that post. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so okay, so you could get a seat, you could lease a seat on the commodities exchange, and and you know there was you know gold, silver, there were there was plenty of stuff to trade here in New York City, um, as well as in Chicago, and. You get into the first you go through the applicant process, right? The FBI crawls around your background because they want to know that you're not part of organized crime, right? right. That was their main deal. Keep right. organized crime out of the securities industry. Right. And then <laughs> right. And then you got thrown into the bottom of the pit because all the top steps were again, prime real estate. You had no right to it until you had either paid your dues or you traded size big enough to stand up there or you had a friend. Right. But even then, even if you had a friend, right, you started at the bottom of the pit. And what did you do? Right. You just watched the order flow. You didn't have there was no computers. You're standing in the bottom of the ring. Right. And all you can see are the screens up there and they just have the last price. Mm -hmm. So in a sense. Right. So and it worked the same way on the stock exchange floor where you go to the luncheon club and you, they actually had a paper ticker when I was there, you know, when I was 20. And um there were people who just stood there and, and read the paper as it went by. It was, you know, in those days we did 12 million shares a day so that it was easier to read the tape. But, right. But um, trading, but, but back in those days, trading was synonymous with watching order flow and reading tape, right? I mean, it's just like, right. yeah, if you're trading, of course, that's what you're doing. You're watching right. order flow. Like, and so, so, yeah, okay, so you stand in the, you're here. Hey, I got, you know, I got my spot in the ring. Right. And now what do I, you know, what do I do? Right. Well, you can only say, well, you know, look, there's a big guy over there and you ask the guy next to you, like, who does that guy represent? And he's like, oh, he represents Goldman or Cargill or somebody huge. Right. And so you get a feel for the story. And so. Right. And, and there were books, right. You know, the reminiscence of stock operator. There's a book that's written as as a partner to that. That's on tape reading. I forget. It's a blue blue paperback cover yep and so we so every... that actually. Yeah. oh you do right yeah, yeah i forget yeah. what it's called is it tape reading or something like that yeah it's like something i mean it looks like a manual yeah I mean, yeah it's, it's, yeah it's very low low key so i mean that was the idea it's like okay so you, you it you know it became like a story right and so you knew you knew what were the what were the things that were required of the person who was doing a large amount of business to move the price. For example, 
if you were long and you needed the market to go up, you needed to clean out every offer. I mean, every offer in the ring, right? So you literally had to sometimes, and Mark Fisher, the famous Mark Fisher from who owned MBF Clearing, would just come in the ring um, here over next door at NYMEX and, and COMEX, and he would just bid through the offer and take everything. And Stottlemyre used to say the same thing, right? Where you just you just have to literally clean out all the all the supply and then bid through it, right? And in a sense, uh, you know that. These are things that are learned through tape reading. Now, how does that help everybody watching, right? Because you can't literally clean out, right? The times have changed. Mm -hmm. Well, right? that, like, well, that's, I mean, you, when we were talking, doing some prep for this, you were, you were saying that you felt like actually now it's way fairer and it's way easier because tape gives you a digital footprint. Whereas before in the ring, someone could hide sides, right? They yep. could, they could. Yeah, yeah, for so sure. We all did. A little bit? Yeah, yeah. If you needed to cover a position in the ring, you just hand an order to your broker friend, and it, he would just pretend like it's a customer thing. You know, <laughs> the whole ring is short, right? And you didn't want to be seen as the guy who was like upsetting the apple cart, because right. you know the, everybody's watching everybody, and you know the first one that blinks, you know, is like ostracized, right? You just have to sit there and and hope that you know the market keeps going down, and then everybody can cover, and then we're good. Because it usually took the whole ring to take out Goldman or somebody like that, or you know somebody big. Right. Now there, there there is no such thing as a ring, and so and to your point, right, that everybody leads leaves a digital footprint. Okay, so implicit in that digital footprint is that you can see size and you can see the expectations, right? And, and sort of I and I haven't talked with Lucci about this, but you can see the expectations associated with the people who are trading that size. And then remember, Charlie, you and I have talked about a lot of it about how people who aren't getting what they need are easier to predict than those people who are getting what they need, right? Yeah. Can you break that down for people who, who haven't been, you know, in the oh, course of yeah. yeah. For example, if you know, one thing we would learn is that if someone and I've seen this happen in real time. Like someone's up, uh, you know, 50 points in a, on a big position in a stock. They're like, let's go to lunch. And you're like, Jesus, you, you know, you have this huge position, but they're so far in the money, they don't care. And But someone's got a million shares of, of say, IBM. They've got a million shares of IBM. It's trading right there and it starts to go bad, right? You know, they got to go. That's the most the dependable, right? Big position, threshold, and it's not working, that's seriously easy trade. You know, that person's going to go, you get short, the guy's got to sell them, you continue to get short. I mean, Wall Street's been that way for 100 years, right? It's starting right. down on, on people who are losing money. And, and that person with their back against the wall is much more predictable, you're saying. Right? Even if you, you know, in a social situation, right, if you have a disagreement with a person in a social situation or even in a negotiation, right, and you, they're not, it's not going good. They're predictable. Mm -hmm. But if someone's getting what they want in a social situation or in a business negotiation, they're highly unpredictable. So, you know, those, that's one of the lessons that you learned from watching tape reading, from being in the ring that are now that you can now, given that the electronic footprint is there and given that you can see the inventory, right, that's being traded in that size mm -hmm. from many different methods. And then you can assume, given the way that they're entering or exiting the trade, that there are expectations associated. And of course, the, the magnification of the potential dissatisfaction having to exit is dependent on the size. So right in a sense, the goal of tape reading is to assemble both a feel for the inventory and the level of their, the price level of their position. So you know where that threshold is. Right. Right. And many trend following systems can be synthesized. <laughs> Thank you. Um, synthesized to create that so many people out there who are watching if you are building a, a trend following system you can get from a vwap or or even using the wide spots and profiles to see where the average cost of the, of all the longs are in an, in an uptrend assuming that people can't buy the tails people can only trade where the market spends time and then if the market has been distributing itself higher, you can assume that they're getting to buy them at all the, 
the places where they spent time. And then from there, you can average those together and synthesize an average cost, if you follow me, of the participants of whatever duration move that you're looking to try and understand where the inventory, the average, it's like a VWAP in a sense. And so you can use the VWAP in regards to with a sort of a volume participation degree and see how many people have the position and then trade against it if it goes bad. Well, that leads me into wanting to talk to you about your, like how do you use tape right now in your trading and how, how do you track order flow? What, what's your go-to? Like what are you pulling up on your screens? I mean, everybody, I mean, well, right. First we come in and, and, and what does it say? It says, like you said, trade what you see, not what you think. <laughs> Right. That's an actual, I didn't pay Chris to put that card up. That is an actual right. card that Chris puts on his desk every day. <laughs> and right, it says, it says, it, it's, it looks like it's been modified. It says react, not predict. And it says trade what you see, not what you think. And then on the very bottom, it says, what does the market want to do? Okay. So that's a good place to start, right? You have to dance with the girl that brought you. That's, you know, we're trying to be in step with an organic process. It's way out of our control. And I so think, I think there's probably some some students of yours, Chris, that are that have we want to be in step with an organic process that is out of our control tattooed on their chest right. after having like that, listened to you for years. <laughs> it's like okay, right. there's one thing I want to learn and understand. It's how to be in step with this organic process. And right. I learned this today. one from Peter, right? It says do not give gut feelings first priority, right? So we're gonna default to what we see happening in front of us, right? Mm -hmm. Um so what are you, you looking at market profile, right? I mean, you said you look at tape a little bit. Like I know you um, have Billy, their softwares that you use. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's many different ways. Billy Gallner, his father was a, a, a specialist and he was also groomed to be a specialist. I asked him one day, I said, how, you know, I'm kind of confused. And he said to me, the market will tell you, let the market tell you and then seek that direction. Um, so all of these are elements of tape. And you're asking a specific question of how, how how do you tell right i mean you i mean you have indicators such as there's a i i'm a customer of cqg and mm -hmm. i use um a product they have called trade flow um mm -hmm. which shows people either hitting or lifting on the stack mm -hmm. um in the old days in the ring we used to just turn around and ask the big brokers you know they'd have a deck in of, of tickets like they'd have a deck of tickets in their hand Right. And then the way they were organized was that the the sell orders were stacked to the upside and the stops and the buy orders were stacked to the downside. And whichever way the deck was staggered, whichever had more orders, because the market loves to facilitate transactions. So we would just literally go to whichever place the, there were more orders. So if you're trying to, in other words, you're trying to sort of predict or get a feel for the potential tape action of the day. One thing you should be aware of is, is, you know, hey, you know, I mean, there's a crude way of saying it is, which is, you know, what's going to screw the most people, but you should say it in a more sort of a polite way and say, you know, where do you think the more, more orders lie? Where does the market feel as though there's the most business to be done? Yeah. And, and so, um, I think, so you, I think that's really important because <clears throat> that's a point that you come back to, that Lucci comes back to, that Jay, Jake calls it Max Payne, that, that he always comes back to, he always <laughs> talks about the same thing. And I think if you're, if you're a trader and you don't have in your mind a sense of where that Max Payne point is for the market right now and whatever you're trading, then that is potentially an indication to you that you are trading blind in a certain way, that you are not in well, we're all, with that organic right process, we're, we're all trading sense. blind right so we're gonna it's given that we're all trading blind and so make sure if you're out there listening to try and get over the need to guess let the market let the market tell you uh and wait for a setup i've i've really found that by curating the entries uh it gives you a much better chance at um a avoiding trauma b um, getting time on your side, you know, good trade location when you start is very similar to good trade, uh, good real estate location when you buy your house, right? And so, um, to the to the point of Max Payne, um, 
if you think about what AI, AI, of course, is now the rage, right? And, and so what AI has done to the markets is, is in a sense, um, everything that's already happened um, is completely predicted by AI because they, they can only work with what has happened. This is a really and, good point. Yeah. Right. Go and yeah, and on. to your Max Payne point is is that Max Payne is a, generally associated with something that's never happened before, right? And so if something's happened before, that's pretty much already baked into the cake. So it's it's literally we have to sit here and say okay, the, what is the likelihood of something that has never happened happening today and then if that were to happen, which way would it go? And then, you know, are there the orders to justify that move happening? Mm -hmm. And so logic is just one of these things where you just assume that the, or, you know, subjective, our subjective logic is one of these things where you just assume that what's happened in the past is going to be always what happens in the future. But given the only way that humans survive against AI is that stuff is going to be happening that has never happened before. And we have to become much more flexible to the idea that, you know, there's nothing top of book and things can move. So, um, yeah, so tape is important in that regard as in like whatever boundaries that you feel as though the market has to respect, I think are less valuable than they used to be mm -hmm. in regards to max pain, right? So max pain is something, let's, what would you define max pain as, right? Something that you were not prepared for, right? Size of move that is fast and obviously on, on, on I don't know, what would we say? Just out of the blue? Well, it's just going to, it's going to cause the most pain for the most people, right? The most, right. And may, maybe, and hopefully that's not you, but, uh, but the majority I know, of but... where, <clears throat> yeah, market participants are positioned, right? Yeah. So, all right. So what's the input to what are the, you know, where are people missing? People are missing the boat on the idea that something that has never happened could happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Or so, you, I mean, you... there's, or the, or they're assuming that what, typically has happened in the past is what's going to happen <laughs> right. again, right? I mean, that's right. what AI, that's what artificial intelligence is really good at, right? Training on right. past data and right. making a prediction based on that. And now people can be like, yo, markets are fucking weird right now, man. Like stuff is happening all the right. time. Like you got to throw that out. And I can right. see it's it like on this, the tape. I can see what's happening in front of my It's super eyes. binary, right? Like it's either completely controlled because AI is right and everybody's trying to constrain it within the boundaries of what has been a normal reversion to the mean event. You know, tide comes in, tide comes out, tide comes in, tide goes out, sun comes up, sun goes down, right? All of these are mean reversion sort of ways to participate in the market. But then, yeah, when AI is wrong, that's the max pain right there. And so, so I guess what we could say is that the tape will immediately change character, mm -hmm. right? One side will be gone and it will move very quickly and there will be no clean exit. For the bad right? revolution, you mean? Or for, yeah, for the people who are wrong, right? Like there's no easy exit. In the old days, we talk about professional courtesy, right? If you sold them right, the market would come back and, and, and give you one finger snap of an opportunity to get out at a scratch or close to a scratch and then go. Now that's gone. Yeah. So we don't, we don't necessarily have, right? Because of AI, we have this binary world where it's either tightly constrained or completely unhinged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that the, the message in, in Lucci's sort of tape as a religion <laughs> is, is the, all due respect, um, faith functions, um, is that uh, you, you're glued to the idea that, that uh, you have, you know, what's working now. And, and as soon as it's not working, is he, he is quick to exit, I believe. From what i've seen oh yeah he's incredibly quick to exit and you know right. flip his position and go the other way and that's you know again he's he's basing that on on tape um right so you know back to the teacher thing um 
and and for people out there, I think everybody um, would benefit from having teachers. I certainly did. Um, my teachers were Victor Sprandio, um, Pete Stottlemyre, and then Steve Hawkins, of course. Uh, Walter Frank was chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, was my first boss. Um, and, you know, we had conferences on, or uh, seminars on the exchange. You know, Steve Neeson, these guys from uh, Options as a Natenberg's options as a strategic investment. If you ever really dislike somebody, give them that book option. Put them to sleep. <laughs> I was going to say, it's, it sounds really fucking boring. Man. Right. It's con it was considered the Bible at the time. And it's I'm important. sure it's great. I'm sure it's great. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. Not, you but did. It it's like 40 Valium. And, and, uh, <laughs> and well, so uh, the point being is, is that A, investigate your teachers, right? And B, seek them out, right? And, and, uh, and I think that uh, it can be really helpful because the trading is such a lonely experience. And even the reason why I come here to work with these guys who are huge silver traders or huge uh, um, metal, um, oil traders is that we can look at each other and, and talk our way out of a rabbit hole. You mm. know, what do you think? You right. know, where did I go wrong? Right. And I mean, you have that in your community, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, which is absolutely. I mean, because it's messy, right? This is, think about it, right? Like, it's like, it's almost like we work in a kitchen. It's so messy, right? Well, you know, tra you can't be perfect. It's like, you know, these people who make pastries are perfect, right? They're like, you know, everything's measured to the micron. And, you know, it's like us, we're like making pizza or something. It's just, you know, <laughs> spinning, spinning dough. And then, you know, oh, you know, the oven's about 650, who, you know, who knows? But the idea of trading is to be able to be flexible, understand who, what we're up against, and then, you know, be able to survive all these years and, and still like it, which is, which I think is, if for everybody is, watching out there, you need to structure your life so that you like this. Which is one and of the today, things about, ta about talking to you too, is because, you know, not to blow smoke up your ass, but you've been doing it for, you know, for a long time, you got a ton of experience, but you still have the hunger is palpable for you to try new things. You're still so curious about new sources of edge, talking to new people, you know, what, it's what, really what life doing. affirming. I mean, to not to get too crunchy and, and Boulder, Colorado ask on everybody. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's really a sense of freedom to be able to hit the mouse and, uh, and say, I think, I mean, implicit, you know, it's a two edged sword, right? You hit the mouse and then you have to say, well, wait a minute, 80% of the people who do, who hit the mouse are wrong. So you have to immediately step back from the, the first, you know, to hit the mouse, you say, I think I'm right. When you hit the mouse is that's, that's ego strength. That's great. Hit the mouse, do it. But then as soon as you do hit the mouse, understand that you have a, a you know, one in five shot of being right. So that the secret is, is how quickly can you fail? And then, you know, just be like, okay, done. And then not tag, not tag yourself as a loser. Cause you know, in a sense you, you had the freedom to say, I did this. And then you had the you, with implicit in our job description is being able to say I'm wrong fast and not, knock yourself out of the game emotionally or mentally and that that's essentially the job description of a trader because you know participation is is the you know reading tape requires that you're actively involved and you're here in the present moment and, and so you know okay so i'm here in the present moment that means i'm going to try and trade if i'm going to try and trade then i got to realize that the the flip side between you know in gambling you place your your money on the black or red and roulette and the guy has a scooper arm and he comes and he takes your your chip away and the, all you have to do is place the bet right so you see how the difference between trading and gambling is in, in gambling you just place the bet right and then the guy with the scooper arm comes and scoops your chip away and then you reach out and you place your bet again in trading you gotta be you gotta be like i'm done you have to be like i'm done because they'll keep scooping your money out of your pocket until you actually say i'm done right and so over the t over time you start to learn that there's less site cap depletion less financial cap depletion less emotional cap depletion by saying i'm wrong first yeah. than everybody else and and i think that's part of tape like you can you can see it you, and and you can see the market go against you and you can see that it's not working and then Lucci seems very good at being able to be like, gotta go. Yeah. Gotta go. And so for people watching, if you're having a hard time from seeing that it's going bad to 
executing quickly, you know, execute first and then ask questions later. Don't get, you know, don't get trapped in the why. Work through your mental processes to see if there's a way that you can shorten the duration between when you see it's going bad and just being like gone and not, not make it a punishing sort of cat catastrophic upset that you, or trade smaller and keep practicing, you know, with marginal trades and getting out for a small loss or a small win so that yeah. you can, you if through a larger sample size, you can get used to that, right? Because everything about everybody else's job, it's so nebulous, right? But yet here we have our results, like we have to wear our results freaking every day, right? Like every other job with maybe the exception of an emergency room surgeon that I can think of, like no nobody has the black and white face the music event that we face and so you you know if you're not surrounded by people who think that it's normal um you're gonna have to train yourself to think that that's normal and get used to that and first of all and not attach a huge amount of self-esteem to a, a big winning day or on the flip side don't go jump off the golden gate bridge because you had a bad day right right and um, quick aside for my brother's an ER doctor and his he has he's in San Francisco and his his turf is the is the uh, Golden Gate Bridge and he actually talked to a kid who came in who had jumped off the bridge that lived and he asked him what were you thinking about when you jumped off the bridge and the kid said I realized that my biggest problem was that I had just jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge <laughs> true story and now the guy has a speaking tour um apparently That's amazing isn't that amazing and so yeah. but the point about trading is is that you you know look you have to you can't catastrophize so if you're having that problem of being able to move from understanding that you had such high hopes when you hit the mouse and now it's not working to get out quickly and then try and just recognize that that's part of the job description instead of catastrophizing and if you're if you're if you're if your trading is actively is is reading the tape that means that you're going to have like anybody you're going to have mistakes remember eight out of ten people lose everything yeah so we're you know you trade what you see but that doesn't mean that things can't change right think about this right you're sitting in a world where you only have the inputs from what you can see around you yet you're trading something that's on a global scale that people have it's not a level playing field we all we don't even have to go down that road it's not a level playing field but there's so many inputs to the present moment that you can't see all right so how's this if you need a hook to let yourself off a trade that you're like all of a sudden it goes bad for no reason dalai lama says you know you're standing next to a volcano and it blows up it's not your karma Okay, you were just in the wrong place. Right. So, um, the understanding is is that you're looking for some way to be able to say I don't know without it causing any sort of massive emotional catastrophe. Then you just say, look, there's so many inputs to the to the present moment in a product that is world globally traded that I can't. I'm only I can only see, you know, so far, and that would be an important step in the right direction to be able to be nimble enough and flexible enough to trade using the tape, which is a very, um, shall we say, involved process, right? You have to be, you know, the, the guys in the ring had laser, laser focus um, ability to concentrate through the noise and through everything and through all the jumping around and screaming and yelling. And then the guys on the trading floors on the big board were very cool, calm, and collected, right? These are, you know, it's like a fighter pilot mentality. If you're going to be that close with that much size, you have, you, and you know that people have similar positions to you. And if you have big size, you know that people are going to run in front of you because they, you know, they can, they know because you leave your tracks. People know what your position is because just like you leave your tracks they leave their tracks too right we use them they know our position I, you know citadel renaissance you know think about those people are freaking smart right <clears throat> right and that's i mean that is something Lucy talks about is being able to spot you know buy programs and everything in tape um Whew. you know chris i want to ask you about you know can kind of continuing this theme of of lessons that you took from the ring and translated up to you know the screens and how that pertains to tape one of the things that you said right. when you're prepping for this is you know when a move is happening you want light opposite activity to sustain the move 
That's Stottlemyre. He, that a bit. Yeah. Sure. You know, he, you know, you want, I mean, for years, right. We always traded in a bull market. Right. And so the brokers were always buyers. Always. Right. The, you know, you're standing in the ring. You're like, okay, what are the brokers? All the brokers just have big buy orders on their decks. You're just like, okay, you know, this person's going to pay a lot. And then this next person comes along and that broker is going to pay even more. Okay, fine, whatever. Right. You know, and then the, finally the, you know, after a hundred of these guys, you're like, okay, sold, but this is enough, right? Like I've, I've, I've watched enough. It's, we're way overdone. But the understanding is, is that when you have light opposite activity, when the market dips, you have natural buyers there, right? You right. see a lot of times in electronic trading where they run the stop straight up and they clean out the deck and then there's no bids underneath it and it comes right back down. That's what Ross right? was talking about last week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. And so there were guys who wanted to actually write programs when, pro when we first started trading. I remember these guys who are big pit traders and they were like, I want to write a program that when you get a vertical move, it immediately measures if there are replacement bids underneath the market. And if there aren't, you get short immediately. Right. I was like, wow, pretty good. I, I don't think any, because somebody go out there and write that program right? and, and, and make money on it. Because I think, um, so the light opposite activity, the light opposite activity in creates the perpetuation of the move. Right. And you understand that as we move further in duration, you're more prone to, um, to retracements, right? The more people that get involved, the more people are entering and exiting. So that's when you start to get the retracements. And that's essentially the imbalance. Once an imbalance is present in the market, it's very difficult to shake out that imbalance. And the light opposite activity that you see along the way is, is something that's kind of building into that, the, ex, the ability for the market to carry further than you ever think. And so that's, you know, there's all these things like you never want to fade a slow moving market, right? That would be the same thing as light opposite activity, because a slow moving market means that it's in the case of going up, it means that there's a big buyer and then he's chewing through the sellers, albeit some people are getting short for whatever reasons, lack of momentum, just on a sheer, on a reversion basis um, for whatever reason. But the understanding of, um, never fade something slow, and yet you can fade something that's quick. These are all elements that you need to understand in regards to when you're actually, when we're watching the tape, right? We, and essentially, the, if you're watching the market anyway, you're essentially watching the tape. And you get these unconscious feelings too, right? Like, oh, you know, this feels bad to me, or I've seen this before, things like that. And so um, just a quick point there, well, what Peter was uh, when I taught with the clear, clear mind trading mm -hmm. thing, he, he mm -hmm. was saying that um, try not to give your gut feelings priority unless it's something bad is going to happen. But the, in, in regards to, in, which is something that I think is right. Um, but in, in regards to your gut feel, that's an element of the tape, right? That's your subconscious and your conscious working together without yeah. getting too crunchy, right? No, I think that's a really important distinction because we have, we have, if you, it's, oh, you can't, it's all about context, right? If you, you can't you can't pick a random trader and say, Hey, trust your gut or don't trust your gut because the question is, is your gut calibrated? Like Lucci, it's pretty incredible to hear him talk about him and some of the people who, who have learned from him who really use tape and, and are in sync with tape. Like he can feel in his stomach a move that is happening because as you just described, he is consciously or or you know his consciousness and his subconscious is are sort of linked into one another and he is feeling somatically a move that is his subconscious is processing <clears throat> uh, we lost finely tuned fine finely tuned machine we lost your uh oh your i think your internet is maybe a little messed up we lost your video uh oh uh oh yeah. uh oh oh let me check i'm plugged in Technical difficulties, folks. Give me a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Cam, okay. hold on. Matt's, yeah, no. Matt's saying you're good, so maybe you're good. If you guys can still see Chris, then yeah, not, then maybe it's just on my side. Okay. Anyways, um, you know, so Lucci's, that, Lucci's got to yeah. be like one finely tuned animal. Think of his background too, right? Like learning how to trade tape. That's like literally going into battle every day because he's he's literally he's all process, right? There's no structure. 
Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I could say all that. And we would I actually want to, I want to tease apart process and structure with you in a second. That's, that's one of the last places I want to go in this. But what I was saying is like, you, people can learn to trust their gut, but you have to train your gut. You have to, to hone your gut, right? And for some new trader who comes in, who's been looking at head and shoulders patterns for three months, like, no, you probably shouldn't trust your gut because your gut is not informed, right? But if, if you have, you know, the, the hours behind the screen and if you're doing something like reading tape and your gut is being, is, is being informed by, you know, being in step with the organic process, as Chris describes, then you can start listening to your gut a little more. I've seen people, I mean, all due respect, I've seen people walk in off the street, step into the ring and make a hundred grand in their first week. Just like some people have yeah. that feel, some right? People, okay, but like to say <laughs> to say that, that's also like being like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Gian, Giannis. Santa Claus, who didn't, right? Who was seven Santa feet tall, who didn't play basketball until he was like a sophomore in high school. Yeah, you get freaks who walk in off the streets yes. and go play in the NBA, yes, but right. the rest of you, us can't can't assume that that's going to happen right right and, and, I, and took honestly, me the most decades the, the most fucked up traders that we get psychologically are the ones who in their first week buy some lotto options and just works out in their favor and then they're like oh i'm a natural at this this is not that hard and then reality just slaps them across the face and they are chasing that high of yeah. that huge win for, for the, years you can like the high school right the, the high school quarterback you know goes out into the real world and never does anything because it was right. too easy. Right. Reality, yeah, yeah, it's too right. easy, right? Right, it was um, too easy. You touched on process versus structure. This is something you go way deeper into in the course. I think this this has yeah. the potential to blow people's minds, but may, I, maybe we can touch on this a little bit. Can you tease apart what you mean when you say process versus structure? It came and how from it relates to tape. It came from. Um, uh, Fogarty and Bowen's um, systems theory, which came from the Center for Family Learning in New Rochelle, and um, which is about family therapy, by the way, people were right. talking about markets. We're and, talking about yeah. And a friend of mine, Howie Cohen, used to describe the markets. He was older than I was, and um, he actually got blown. He got blown out and came back being short calls in the '87 crash. And I was like, holy shit! Right? Can you imagine? It was just like he was right the direction, but the vol blew him out, and. Uh, oh right could you imagine That's but so he would funny. he would say he would say that he would say it's like trading is like being in a bad marriage like you, have to, you literally have to come and you know because the market the 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 price behavior actually has a personality right it's millions of people acting in their own best interest distilled to either up or down yes or no uh, very black and white and of course, we know life is much more gray. We have many more tools to deal with the gray palettes of, of life. But the idea of process and structure, which is also very much important to understand when uh, other people say that the longer time frames always went out. I was talking to Stan Yabroff from CQG's ahead of uh, CQG's um, sort of technical development side. He was a, he's an old guy. He must be 80 now, but he's a huge, not a huge guy, but a gold trader in the back in the day. And he, he was talking to me about um, Fibonacci's and I, I was like, yeah, no, go away. But like we clean out the deck, right? In, in short term, in, when we're reading tape and you clean out the deck, there's nothing underneath it, right? There's no orders till you get to a new high or a new low. So intraday retracements are not something that you need to use when you're trading on a short-term basis. But he, here's Stan. My point being is that he was saying that if you take the starting point, the start time of a contract, the first day it ever traded, and you use FIB ratios between the all-time high and the all-time low, like those longer-term time frames are very, you know, he goes, they're, they're super significant. There's a lot of money around those areas. And so he's 80. So I, I was like, okay, you know, he's obviously been around the block. He's very smart. Right. And then there are other people who say in regards to structure, there are other people that say that the longer term time frames always went out. And in, in psychiatry, they always say, or in family therapy, they always say change that occurs quickly is less permanent than change that occurs slowly. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, we had been working with this other software provider who was always like, you can fade a fast move. And we always talk about boiling frogs, right? That, you know, you never fade a slow move. Right. So, so the idea is, is that longer 
period players. There are people who only trade not on the minute by minute basis, but there are people who trade in a, in a structure environment that are a big part of the sort of the background of trading. And mm -hmm. so, um, and process of course is when you see the tape going by and you see everything happening, how's it feeling right now? Um, breaking one minute trend lines process is much more uh, reading tape. And so, and so just being, so when I talk about it, I just want you to start to grasp the idea that there are two different types of things happening when you're trading, right? There's the conscious mind watching the process go by which and is then the tape going by on the tape screen. going by, Order right? Going by, right? Right. And the sort of the longer duration stuff has created a structure. Right. And um, we and are you looking at that in market profile? Like, yeah, you can you, see yeah. that in market profile for sure. Yeah. And 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 because you know, the investment of time in reading tape means that there's probably a lot of people who are using structure because they don't have the ability to commit that amount of effort and time to process and reading tape. And so from a, from like a making a living perspective, reading tape, I think is a really good method to do so because nobody, that's a niche, you know, what's, who's in that niche, right? People like me and like everybody else who's probably watching, right? We're watching and we're trading short term, we're paying the rent and who's our competition. It's like Renaissance Citadel, right? So it's, it's, Right. So there it's or like you know, or like Robin Hood traders who are just right. have no but idea. But they're not, doing. you know, they're not trading, you know, levered like we are for like literally for like ten handles. Sometimes they are. <laughs> oh, they are. Okay, right. I I'm not, I you would know they're better than I do. But the understanding is is our niche, right? Our niche in, in reading tape and that process centered strategy. As long as you understand that you need to keep a weather eye to the longer duration stuff so that you you don't get run over by them and you understand that you're you're participating, your window of participation is anything from five seconds, thirty seconds, a minute, five minutes, something like that, right? Yeah. Um Another way of saying this is that maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you're saying you have to, you also have to have some some sort of memory, right? Like, yes, you want to live in the present moment and take in what the order flow, watch what is happening right now, but you also have to have some sense of okay, what what's been happening over the last month, three months, six months? Where have people been in this name, and what you know, what's the context for what's happening right in front of me? And also, yes, very important point, but the the within that context you need to say are those people who were in a month ago still there right 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 in other words if there's a move that would have knocked them out it could be that that because if you think about you know the most recent information about a high or a low it used to think that that a low was like you know huge volume washing out and you know we we're always looking for that cataclysmic dump which never came in 2008 by the way um, it just went sideways at the low. And so those Phoenix bottoms, those washouts, and, and everybody's always looking for a blow off top. Remember all this, all this stuff about like, oh, it's like a fireworks or something, you know, it's so easy, this crash of some massive proportions. And the most recent thinking is, is that it's actually just a lack of volume. In other words, the buying goes high enough to shut off the, the, I mean, the price goes high enough to shut off the buying. And, the, and in the case of a, a bottom, right, they're much they're much slower, right? In other words, that there's not a Phoenix bottom and off they go. They're much slower now where it's just a lack of volume on the lows. And then it starts to, to attract new buyers. Okay, the price is so low that it's shut off selling. So my, my point is, is that within the context of understanding what a high or a low and the behaviors most recently associated with said highs or lows, and, and then looking back and saying, okay, are the people who were involved two months ago, are they here or are they gone? And associating the degree of participation from looking at the prior chart. Because similar to what we were talking about is like, you know, why we don't use intraday retracements anymore is because when the market cleans out the, the deck, Right, think the market runs vertically. Okay, it cleans out the deck, all the orders that were in the ring. We're all standing there now. The guy look, the broker looks at his orders and he's got nothing higher and all he's got is orders lower. 
right? So we're up here and everyone's like, well, no orders any up here. So down we go. Right. So, so, you, so we find a lot more barbell distributions in regards to the, the sort of the short term process where the markets go up and they find all the orders above the highs. And then the next stop, because you've cleaned out everything on the way up, the next stop is new lows. Because that's the only place that there are orders, right? There are stops under the lows. Right. <clears throat> right. Isn't it? And so in, so in regards to the process, right, there are many, 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 many things that make perfect sense when I explained to you that you would have never thought about because no one's ever been in the ring. No one wouldn't. No one ever really thinks like, oh, you know, like, oh, look, there's, you know, 50 percent of the range. Well, it doesn't mean anything anymore because you just cleaned out the range. There's no orders there. Right. Remember, what's the market's job? Market's job is to facilitate trade. So it's the market's job isn't to make a 50% retracement. The market doesn't care about a 50% retracement. The market just wants to go where there's the most amount of business to be done. Or as, G, as Jay says, Max Payne. Right, right. And I think <laughs> when, we, when we say that everything is taped, like the whole theme behind this, this series is exactly what you just described. The market's job is to facilitate facilitate transactions right right and right. so and the process by which what we've just talked about the process by which you can observe that happening is in the tape and that is true right. for all markets that's right every single type any anything you can trade right that's why we say everything is taped there's always a way to observe that process and that's you know that's i mean without we, getting too crunchy right you were you were born with a physical body and you have an opportunity to trade it it really pays to be active from a participation in life sort of perspective, as well as getting your feet wet. And so if you're, if you're, if you're hesitant about participating size down and trade more actively, use, use what you see. If you can find tells in the tape, right? If you can find those tells in the tape, use those and, and just trade for trade, very small trade, a micro or something like that. And, learn the, the character you're saying yeah i was going to say get in the game learn the characteristics from actually you know it's a not you want to make sure that you're pounding home these non-conceptual realizations like like we can say all these things but until you actually get out there hit the mouse and make the trades um and see what works and what doesn't work um in a sense you're you're just paper trading in your mind with these new concepts so I mean, there's a story Pete was in the ring and, and he had a friend of his come in the bond ring in the old days. And the guy was doing a point and figure chart because we didn't have computers at the time. And uh, the guy stood there for four months. And uh, and so finally, Pete just got pissed at him. And he walked into the ring, just true story, walked in the ring and he goes, what's here? The guy goes, eight, nine. And Pete says, sold you a hundred and walked out. And a hundred bonds is a, is, a, is, is a lot of bonds. And so... Um, to to the point where um you know you you have to make the leap to participating um the tape forces you into the present moment the tape gives you a feel the market will tell you if you let it it's so weird it's like what do i think well it depends on what it thinks <laughs> like what what do you think well just sit here and it'll tell you what it thinks so you know, and then it's just a matter of measuring your risk reward, your trade locations, um, judging the background structure, and then making sure you're in step with the process. Now, if you're trading against the trend, which is possible to do in tape, uh, because you'll see what appears to be it's sort of a peak and then there's no follow through. You have to be quick. In other words, when we're counter trend trading, please be quick. And when you're when you're trading with the trend, if you're if you think that, you know, you've caught them right, you have good trade location, you think that it's early in the move, right? The move does not have a lot of duration attached to it already, and that you have the potential to hold on to this thing. Remember good opportunities carry further than we ever think. So at that point you have to be patient and understanding the the consciously understanding the difference between counter trend trading and then potentially longer term trading. I find that I'm much more active as a counter puncher. I'm, I'm, that's just the, from being in the ring, I think, right? Or the brokers are all a buyer and you're in the ring, you're like, well, okay, you know, sell them and buy them back, right? Sell them and buy them because you're getting the edge. And, you know, that was the way we were brought up in the pit, right? Never trade without the edge. Now, 
everything's a choice market, so there's no such thing as an edge. Hmm. What do you mean? There's no such thing as an edge. What do you mean? There's no such thing as an edge. There's, there's it, I mean, from a price perspective, eight nine mm. or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Like the markets move vertically, so eight nine, um, or you know, in the options, you know, they're very they're penny markets. And so, um, in the old days, in the ring, it was you know, we say we'd have a range. I think it was. It was in 1994. We had like a 20 handle range for the whole year, and now we do 20 handles in a microsecond. Right. Right. So the edge when you have a 20 handle range for the year was huge, but now edge means nothing. Right. You just want to make sure you're right. 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 Which is important. Again, another thing is that we're trying to work righter, not harder. I like that. Right. Yeah, there's no, there's no need. We, right, the focus. I put that as a post-it note, right? Two post-it notes, which I really, I should have one here. It says, first, don't make it worse. If you find yourself in a bad position, do not make it worse. That's the thing that stops me a lot of times. And then work righter, not harder. Try and try and see if you can find the answer. And um, and you know what's interesting too is that the answer is constantly evolving. It's not like the what worked because the economy has evolved. It's not like we're teaching you any black box things. In the old days, the economy was a, was much more horizontally distributed. In other words, people had inventory. The lumber yard guy would buy lumber when the price of lumber went down. People used to overstaff on the on the floor of the exchange to accommodate for bulges in business. And with the efficiency of McKinsey and all the internet people came along, everything became just in time inventory, which is awesome for us as traders because even countries now have to go to the market. And what do we have? Where are we? We're in the market. Welcome, welcome to the party. But understand that given the, dis the distinction between people that used to acquire inventory. In other words, the lumber yard guy would let the yard and buy up lumber when the price of lumber got cheap. And then he'd let the yard run light when the price of lumber got expensive to where now he just has, you walk into the lumber yard, you're like, I got to build a condo complex. The guy picks up the phone and calls the floor and buys a train load of lumber. Price of lumber goes straight up. He just marks up the price 10%, hands it to the contractor. The contractor is very happy. Lumber yards made its 10%. And now lumber just has this pencil in the chart, just goes straight up. And that's essentially what has happened to markets where they have gone from natural buyers of dips and natural sellers of rallies to the understanding of everybody's got just in time inventory, which means inventory displacements, i.e. tape, plays a much more important distinction because you can't get bailed out by time. In the old days, if you paid a little bit much, you would assume over time, for example, you bought lumber, then all of a sudden there was another seller of lumber, but the general mentality of the way the world worked in business was there were natural buyers of dips and natural sellers of rallies. Now we run just in time inventory, which means that everybody's lean and mean. And you see that in a stock when it has bad news, out it goes, no matter what the price, mm -hmm. right? And this Silicon Valley bank goes bad in like two days, right? right. right? And so this just in time thing is one of the reasons that you know these are so but my point being is is that there are reasons for what we are teaching and what we're doing and they're based on real economic principles that exist in the real world that you can as i always say you can explain across the dinner table to who's ever sitting there and they don't look at you like you have three heads because there's so many people out there that are pitching some sort of black box system that you don't know and i would i would encourage people to to be very careful of ever buying even newsletters where you don't know what the reasoning is or what's in the black box, what's in the soup, what's in the AI, right? And so um, that I think is is one of the advantages of, of actually, you know, putting your time in to understanding the principles of what's real, I mean, what's happening on the tape and the, the way that the market's moving for whatever uh, current economic reason that is uh, just the the most efficient, apparently the most efficient way to do business, which yeah. na now is just lean and mean. And right. so that means, so, you know, like it says on my Twitter thing, it says inventory is more important than price. Mm-hmm.
if you take someone to a restaurant and they're the free Brussels sprouts and you're like, look, there are free Brussels sprouts. And they're like, I hate Brussels sprouts. Like the price makes no difference, right? <laughs> right. The price makes no difference. What you think is cheap, what you think is cheap, someone thinks is freaking expensive, right? right? Price is subjective. So therefore, therefore, then all that matters is, is, is if you had to buy, say you were this lumber broker, right? The guy calls up and he's like, I need a train load of lumber. And you're like, I'm a uh, one bid. And the guy's like train load at 02. And you're like, oh, one bid. And then someone all of a sudden comes along and goes five bid, six bid, seven bid. And you're just like, oh, Jesus Christ, I should have bought the twos. Now I got to pay eight and I'm going to lose my customer. So right. the idea is, is that you, you I mean, have Luch, to, Lucci gave a, like, gave, gave a great example of that, um, that concept in his interview, which we, which is the first interview in this series, uh, uh -huh. I encourage anybody who hasn't seen it to go back and watch it about buying apartments in Puerto Rico, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, I heard that. You know, right? like guy, I'll take 15. Him, yeah. The guy in front of him was like, I'll buy 15 apartments. And all of a sudden in that moment, Lucci was like, whoa. These things, this is this, these things are way more appetizing than they were a millisecond ago because I'm right. seeing the tape. I'm seeing the tape. Right. I'm, you know, price is entirely subjective. So right. I think this is a great place to wrap. Um, I know that some people have some questions. Sorry that we didn't get to answer them. We're gonna get Misfit Happy Hour is gonna start coming back. I know we've sort of taken over Chris's spot with with this series, but we're gonna get Chris back on Misfit Happy Hour so y'all can pick his brain in that right. and uh, collection yeah. of misfits. Thanks everybody for all the kind words about that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining this, and um, and I think that's I think that's it, Chris. Thanks. Man. Really yeah, yeah. I see on. everybody out there, and uh, if anybody's ever in New York, make sure to reach out, and uh, we'll have pints. Sounds good. All right, thanks All right, everyone. Bye. See ya.